Thank you for joining us and welcome to the first event in the 2021 Sega National Colloquium. I'm Matt Volrath and I teach in the Department of Economics and Business here at Ohio Wesleyan University in the Business Administration Program. And I'm really excited about this year's Sagan series. Uh, all of the events in this series are focused on the theme of business and the liberal arts. So that means that all of our speakers and all of our events will be exploring how uh, business, people studying business, people working in business can benefit from the perspective of other disciplines and how people who are studying and working in other disciplines can benefit from the tools and insights that business can bring. So tonight we have a really great lecture for you from Dr. Robert Lloyd. Dr. Robert Lloyd is an award-winning teacher and researcher in the Department of Management at Fort Hayes State University. In addition to teaching management courses, he has led students in travel courses to the Caribbean, South America, and Europe. He serves as the lead consultant for the Management Development Center and regularly provides guest lectures at universities around the world. Dr. Lloyd brings more than a decade of industry experience to higher education. And in addition to private industry consulting, he has also managed his own uh, fertilizer merchandising firm and real estate investments. He worked for six years as a commodities marketer for Coke Industries in Wichita, Kansas, spent several summers on the Kenai Peninsula in Alaska as an outdoor adventure guide and manager, and served one season as auxiliary staff at Marknudu Station in Antarctica. He speaks fluent Spanish and conversational German and French. So as you can tell, uh, Dr. Lloyd is a person with a pretty diverse background of experiences and research interests and approaches to what he does in the classroom. So he's a really good fit for this series. And tonight he's gonna to be talking about how literature can give us a new lens to look at the problems of business and life. So thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Dr. Lloyd for making time. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction, uh, Dr. Bullrath. My, uh... My, per my personal background is very much aligned with what I'm gonna to talk to you about tonight. Uh, and that's widening your lens, looking at a bigger picture to see what's possible for your life, how to reinvent yourself. And so I just wanna say thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this uh, great lecture series. I was looking at some of the other presenters and those are some um, fairly well-known scholars, at least in, in the management and um, in, in our, our field. Um, so uh, thanks again for the opportunity. I want to start off tonight's talk with this with a quick story that many of you might be able to relate to. I went to I went to uh, undergrad in the same university that my younger brother did, and I was a senior, he was a freshman, so we kind of had that dynamic going. Um, first couple of weeks in the semester, I'm over at his dorm room, and he says, "Can I get you to look at my English composition paper?" This was the very first paper he had ever written in college. Uh, th that first that first composition paper that you write, it's usually the teacher says, give me four pages of any story you want to tell. And so he basically, uh, he wrote a paper. He said, I, I just need some feedback. This is my first paper. So I read it. Um, got to him a couple hours later. It said, hey, I've got good news and I've got bad news. Um, I said, uh, the bad news is this is a terrible paper. And I, I could say that to him in a way that uh, you know only only you can say to you know your younger younger brother. I said, but the good news is that you don't have a writing problem. He's like, what do you mean I don't have a writing problem? You just told me that my paper is terrible. I said, you have a reading problem. Uh, and I went on to explain to him that you cannot invent words in the English language. Most of us don't invent words in the English language out of thin air. We have to emulate what we write. Um, emulate what we read by, by the way that we write. So transitional phrases, adverbs, vocabulary, all of that happens as you read. And uh, not unlike many of the other freshmen I knew at the time, he didn't want to read, didn't read his textbooks, didn't read his novels. Um, and so I, I, I start that, um, that story off with the idea that um, comprehensible input is what is going to bolster you in terms of um, everything else that's going to permeate everything else in your life. Um, so I just want to start off with that, with that idea in mind, is that uh, sometimes we have to diagnose the right problem. So um, my, my point being there is if you want to be successful in business, my, my job tonight is to convince you that you need to read. Uh, read anything you can get your hands on. It could be academic press. It could be uh, ESPN articles. Um, it could be uh, business press. It could be CNN, Fox, whatever, whatever you want to get your hands on, um, you need to read. Um, and, the, and the reason um, is that it's going to make you a better person. It's going to make you a better uh, business professional. 
Um, the challenge for us though, is that we are completely inundated with opportunities to do everything else in, instead of read. So my job tonight is to convince you to read more and hopefully over the course of the next uh, 45 minutes, I'll be able to do that. Uh, but my first point is going to be, I wanna show you that um, literature and business are already related, they're already linked. And I wanna walk you through a couple of examples uh, where um, the literature, and by literature, we mean classical literature, it could be popular press, um, but mostly I'm talking about classical literature uh, has influenced business. So I wanna make the case, first of all, that they're already linked. Um, second of all, I want you to see how reading and, and literature can be a process, part of your reinvention process. And we'll, we'll kind of link that back to how businesses reinvent themselves and how you can reinvent your personal brand uh, by reading. Um, and finally, I'm gonna give you some practical guidance on, on what this can do for you. Uh, based on my experiences, I'll cover what the academic scholarly literature has to share about this particular topic. But then I also wanna give you some anecdotal, anecdotal experiences of what I've, what I've seen it do to my personal life. Um, so if you stick around till the end, I'm also gonna give you a bonus. And that bonus is a challenge. And I, um, they have to stick around to the end to see it, okay? Okay, so I, I wanna start off with some of the major works that have heavily influenced the way that we conduct business today. If you look at um, classical literature, which the basic definition of classical literature has, is, there's, there's a standard for it. It has to stand the test of time. It has to change the way we, we view a particular concept of the world. Um, it has to kind of challenge you. And so there's, there are some rough definitions of what classical literature looks like. But if we look at Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, they are the foundation for Western ethics. And, and then by association, they are the foundation for business ethics. Uh, if you look at what uh, Socrates had to say, he said, the unexamined life is not worth living. Uh, and so what that means is that you have to uh, constantly reevaluate your decision-making process. So if you look at stakeholder theory, stakeholder theory says nothing more than, we need to analyze our business decisions in the context of all the stakeholders that uh, are impacted by our business. We need to reflect on that and figure out, okay, are we treating our employees right? Are we treating our, our customers right? Treating our communities right? So I make the case that Aristotle and Plato and uh, Socrates are the foundation for Western ethics and specifically business ethics. So that we, we're, we're already uh, you know, a thousand years BC and we've got the Greeks uh, influencing how we're um, conducting business today. This book, if you've not read it, if you read nothing else uh, of what I talk about today, uh, Sun Tzu, The Art of War, you'll see this constantly referenced in terms of uh, business principles. If you watch uh, Wall Street with Michael Douglas, he, re he refers to this book, Know Thy Enemy. You'll hear a lot of phrase, and when you read this book, you're like, oh, I didn't know that's where it came from. So Sun Tzu is uh, basically the, the first book ever written on uh, competitive advantage. And his, his art of war is about how to outsmart your opponent. Um, and, and so today, even th this, is a, this is a recommended reading book in a lot of MBA programs is to, to understand the art of war. Okay, St. Thomas Aquinas, if you haven't read the Summa Theologica, I've not, I've not read the entire thing. I've read uh, portions of it. Uh, the Summa Theologia was written uh, 13th century roughly. And um, he talks about private property. Um, you know, private property is okay to have, uh, and he's in line with the Catholic Church on this. Private property is okay to have, uh, but we need to use that private property for the, the public good. And so you're already starting to see this element of uh, corporate social responsibility uh, back in, you know, 13th century. So, but the other thing you, you'll get from, from reading St. Thomas Aquinas, he makes an argument in a way that nobody else in the history of, of writing had ever done before. He'll come out and, and make a case for, let's just say, the existence of God. Hey, this is why God exists. Here's how I can prove it uh, using metaphysical realities, whatever. And then he makes his own counter argument. Everything I just said, uh, here's why that might be wrong. Um, and then he makes a final kind of closing argument uh, to his counter argument that kind of kind of squashes all the objections that someone might have. And so St. Thomas Aquinas did two things. One, um, he contributed to this idea of um, free market thought. It's okay to have private property. How do we direct those goods? And it certainly influenced um, the, the coming um, centuries. But just the way that he built his arguments, uh, it was brilliant. 
Um, okay, this next book, The Wealth of Nations, is arguably the most influential book in the history of, um, let's say, modern, modern business thinking. It is uh, the handbook for capitalism. It is the handbook for free market thinkers. Um, the irony is that Adam Smith himself maybe wouldn't subscribe to the extreme capitalistic ideas that many uh, put forth with uh, using his book as kind of the, the foundation. But Wealth of Nations basically came out and said, um, you know what, it's okay to have differentiation. It's okay to, to be good at something and let somebody else trade for those goods. And through that free exchange of ideas, you know, you're, you're a cooper and I'm a, a cobbler. And, and if I need wine barrels, I'll come to you. And if you need your shoes fixed, you come to me. And between the two of us, we'll figure out the right price. And so he was the first one to kind of articulate that, followed um, shortly after by David Ricardo, who talked about the comparative advantages of nations. Okay, so these, these, are, these are books that have influenced the way that we think about business at the time and uh, to modern day. Uh, the Jungle, you probably read about this in your social studies uh, class, probably fifth, sixth grade, maybe high school, about the, the working conditions of you know, early 20th century factories. Um, how to Win Friends and Influence People. This is the, the handbook on charisma. And this came out in the 1930s and it's still used and taught in classes today um, for that reason. How to Win Friends and Influence People is uh, you know, 80 or 90 years old, uh, but it's still a book that is, is heavily referenced. It's heavily utilized. Um, the first day that I walked into my corporate job, there was a, um, our, our founder's book on the shelf and there was this book and I was in sales. And so that just goes to show that uh, it, it's still used from a practical standpoint. Uh, the, the main criticism of this book is that it's not uh, based in science. It's, it's very anecdotal, uh, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have value. Uh, Stephen Covey, you might, have, you might have seen this one. I'm gonna, I'm gonna borrow one of the isms from Stephen Covey's book. He calls it sharpening the saw. And if you've read the book, you know what I'm talking about. He basically says, if you're, if you're stagnant, um, you're not going to go anywhere. So he talks about motivation, personal relationships, uh, how to influence others. This is somewhat of how to win friends and influence people 2.0. My point here is that we, we're already seeing literature impacting business in a very real way. So uh, if nothing else, if you're going to be an MBA, if you're going to be a startup, um, if you're going to be a manager, it doesn't matter what facet of business you're going to get into. These are books that have influenced the way that you're, you're thinking, um, either be, be it through the way that you're being educated, uh, maybe the way that you've already kind of constructed your, your worldview. Um, but my first point here is that uh, reading and, and business are already highly linked. Okay, so the next question becomes, okay, what about the modern influence? It, I get it that if I'm studying history, these are good books to read. Um, but if you look at if you look at the modern CEO's bookshelf, he or she will have many books on their bookshelf. Um, and they uh, there there was a a recent study done by Fast Company that says the average CEO reads sixty books a year. That's more than one per week. Uh, and if you think about the job of a CEO, what's the job of a CEO? It's more or less uh, cultivating relationships. Um, they're empowering their you know uh, their other members of the C level suite try and figure out how they can be better operationally, financially, whatever it is. Um, they're trying to convince their shareholders of whatever proposal they're trying to do. So they are reading for that reason. Uh, Dale Carnegie from that same book, How to Win Friends and Influence People says that 15% uh, of your success is through professional knowledge. The other 85 is your ability to express idea, assume leadership and arouse enthusiasm among those that are around you. So. Uh, John Ron, who is a famous entrepreneur, um, corporate CEO, says basically formal education uh, will make you a living, but self-education will make you uh, a fortune. So, uh, and, and finally, there, there was also a recent study, uh, 2000, this is 2013, so the numbers are probably different, but 80% um, of uh, millionaires read at least 30 minutes per day for self-education. So there is a modern influence and, and there's gonna be a wide variety of, of books that they're reading. Uh, my assumption is that they're going to be reading a lot of modern business press ideas, such as Innovator's Dilemma or Freakonomics or um, any one of these kind of modern uh, takes on the seven, seven friends of highly successful people, but they will also be reading classical literature. They will be reading uh, Sun Shoes, The Art of War. 
maybe Plato's The Republic or Cicero's Orations. Uh, but the idea is that they are reading. And we'll talk about what those, those are uh, here in a second, what the benefits of those are. Um, and I also want to show you the, the empirical evidence is that there is an entire stream of literature on the value of literature as kind of a, and this is the same argument for art in that it's sort of a reflection of modern thinking. Um, art is culture, culture is art. And so there's this whole stream. When I started to do some research on what this actually looks like, um, there's a whole rabbit hole that you can uh, dive into uh, in terms of what social norms are, propagation of ideas, um, and the kind of these cultural influences. But let's move on to the practical. Reading, and this is specifically literature, classical literature, reduces mental stress, okay? Uh, improves self-reflection. So most people who are reading books are probably trying to identify with the characters. You know, if you were in this particular situation, what would you, what would you have done differently? How would you react? So self-reflection, uh, which is uh, one of the main things that you should get from it, okay? It will expand your vocabulary. Um, and, and, and Mac 2018 found that it also strengthens your ability to reason, uh, rhetorical arguments. Go back to St. Thomas Aquinas. If you read St. Thomas Aquinas, if you do nothing else, borrow St. Thomas Aquinas's metric or framework for how he builds an argument. So the, the, the scientific literature, the scholarly literature is showing that there actually is some immense benefits. And this is just scratching the surface. But I also wanted to show the, the I wanted to show you the historical uh, backdrop for what literature has done for business. But I also want to show you what the modern influence is um, on, on, um, on reading good books. Okay. One of the ideas in, in any business program that you're going to see is that everyone talks about change, managing change. Um, and, and if you look at Christensen 1995, he said, basically, you have to put yourself out of business or somebody else is going to do it for you. And we've seen a lot of examples uh, in the last 20 years of, of major corporations going out of business because they did not reinvent themselves. And most of the time, it's, uh, there, there's a maxim in, in corporate America that says, you shouldn't be worried about your competitors that you know. You should be worried about the competitors that you don't know. And I'm going to walk you through an example of what that looks like. But I want to give you an example here, um, a couple of examples, actually. If you are a cigarette company in the 1960s, here's your marketing plan. First of all, you get a doctor to tell, you, tell people that your particular brand of smoking is, is, uh, is better than the other brands. And if you don't believe that, go on YouTube and, and type in 1960s cigarette commercials. You'll see, it, you'll see a doctor sitting on, at his desk smoking whatever brand cigarette and says, research shows that this is better for you than menthol, whatever it is, right? Uh, I'm going to uh, advertise in magazines, uh, TV commercials. Uh, I'm out of my depth here. I'm not, uh, Dr. Volrap is a marketer between us. But, um, so what, what slowly happens is uh, people decide that I don't want to smoke anymore. But if they see themselves as a cigarette company, they're going to quickly go out of business. The, the, the trends in the United States are very clear. Um, fewer Americans are smoking today than they were 30 years ago. But if I'm no longer in the, if, if I don't see myself as being in the cigarette business, but I see myself in the sensation business, I can substantially change the products that I'm offering the, company, uh, the, uh, the market. So what happens is somebody's sitting around and says, okay, we, we need to reinvent ourselves. What do we need to do? Um, the old way of thinking is, hey, we need to be better than all the uh, Marlboro and Maverick and uh, Camer, uh, Camel and all these other companies by putting more, more nicotine in the cigarettes. Um, but if we're, if, we're the new, if we're reinventing ourselves, somebody's gonna say, you know what, what's the problem with smoking? The problem with smoking is smoke. Let's just get rid of the smoke. And of course, what happens in these, I've been in these brainstorming sessions, not this particular one, but we're just trying to spitball and come up with cool ideas. That, that's, that's a stupid idea, it'll never work. Well, lo and behold, uh, now we, we have a different delivery mechanism. You have a, an electronic means of vaporizing a liquid that also carries the, it's the delivery mechanism, the delivery vehicle uh, for the sensation that you're looking for, in this case, um, the ni nicotine. Uh, by the way, the research is uh, coming out early on, on vaping and it is, it's not good for you either. So I, uh, I'm not sure they've gotten out of the, uh, they're still in the sensation business, but it's still quite damaging. By the way, the, the Chinese had a patent on uh, smokeless tobacco long before uh, any of the Western or countries did but it's starting to take off now. 
Okay, let's look at let's look at Kodak. Uh, Twenty years ago, I looked at Kodak's uh, stock price, and it was just it was in the tank. And the reason was they were in the film business, they were in the picture taking business, as opposed to the memory business. Now let's fast forward. Let's say I'm Kodak, and digital cameras come out. They said that's not for us. We're a we're a, a photography company. We're going to sell film. If you went on vacation 25 years ago, you brought extra film. You had to worry about if it's going to go through, uh, you know, the airport scanner. It might, you know, wash out all your, uh, all your pictures. Now everyone doesn't want a cell phone. If I'm Kodak and I'm a, and I'm a film or a, a, a camera industry, then I'm gonna I'm gonna quickly go out of business. If I'm in the memory business, maybe I'm Kodak and I invent uh, digital cameras. Maybe I'm Kodak and I invent Facebook. Maybe I'm Kodak and I invent uh, just the accessibility, the connectivity between taking a, a picture on your phone or a video on your phone and then instantly uploading that to whatever social media outlet that you're looking for. So we have to constantly look at uh, the way that we're doing business and can we put ourselves out of business, meaning our old business model. So if I'm Kodak, maybe there's still a market for, for film, like hard film, and there is for professional photographers, okay? But I need to put that business model out of business and sustain that for as long as I need to. Uh, and I need to be the person inventing um, the memory business, which is basically what social media. Social media is nothing more than uh, capturing memories and, and conversation. Same holds true for if I'm selling buggies, this is you know early 20th century, I'm selling buggies. If I'm in the buggy business and the, and the Model T comes along, I'm gonna be quickly out of business. Unless I see myself as the transportation business, then I'm looking at ways to reinvent the way that I'm uh, transporting people, horses, cargo, whatever it is. Okay, all of this to say, if you take any, let's say upper level business class, you're gonna get this sort of uh, dialogue in the classes. How do we get better? We need to reinvent ourselves. We need to be, we need to offer something to people before they even know they want it. That, that, that's all get, gets baked into entrepreneurship classes, classes on creativity, classes on uh, business policy or business strategy, okay? So we need to take that same level of reinvention mentality and, and apply it to our own lives. So I'm, I wanna walk you through an example here of um, one particular industry that could have gone much differently, okay? So let's look at movies. And these are just rough years. This is, this is my timeline here. If you wanted to be entertained, let's say outside of the house, um, early 1900s, you go to Nickelodeons. They're called Nickelodeons because you can get into them for a nickel. So they were uh, at first black and white and they were first, um, you couldn't hear any sound, silent pictures. Okay, then you slowly get into color, then you slowly get into movie theaters that have kind of uh, feature films, okay? Fast forward 1950s, you have television, you had to buy a television set, you had to be able to receive whatever transmission was out there. Um, then you could actually buy your own. So 1970s, you get the VHS, um, you had to buy the VHSs, and now 1980s, you get movie rental stores uh, come around. Anyone who grew up in the 1980s or 90s, if I said, be kind, they would be able to complete the phrase, which is rewind, okay? So that just meant when you when you rented from the movie store, they would charge you 50 cents if you didn't bring it back uh, re rewound, and that meant that you had to actually uh, rewind the tape all the way back, so the next person that rents the movie, it starts from the beginning and not from the middle or from the end, okay? Then fast forward to the 1990s, you got uh, invention of um, DVDs have become more prevalent. Um, and then look at this. Now you have uh, Redbox where you can actually go and uh, rent movies without going into a store. Um, you can stand there and kind of choose. Uh, and, and they're also a lot sleeker. You can kind of, uh, um, VHSs were very, very bulky. DVDs are still kind of bulky, but the way Redbox uh, did it, it was a lot sleeker, kind of in and out. Okay. And then fast forward uh, to you know the the advent of Netflix. Um, Netflix was really the the game changer, and now you've got Hulu, you've got Amazon Prime, and then you've got 500 other ones that that are now coming out there. And what I haven't put on here actually is that now I'm not just Netflix. Now I'm not just uh, allowing you to subscribe to content that I've paid for the copyright to to deliver to you. Now what I'm in, now what I'm doing the next one here is I'm making my own content. So somebody's making their own content and I, who knows what's next after that. I, I happen to think this is my personal opinion. Again, I'm not a marketer. Uh, what about choose your own adventure uh, television show? So they're filming a film and, or a movie and you've got Denzel Washington and he's got to film eight different um, endings to the movie. So uh, Denzel walks into the house. Does it go right or does it go left? Okay. 
uh, some guys uh, hanging on a cliff, do you help them, do you not? And then you've got these different, and so who knows what the next invention is? That's for somebody uh, much smarter than I am. But the idea is it will not stay stagnant right here, okay? It's going to go somewhere else because these are uh, reinventing themselves. Now, what I want you to do, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of Blockbuster. So um, I, I remember when Blockbuster went out of business and I remember thinking um, they, they tried to catch up too late. If you remember for a very brief period of time, there were Blockbuster boxes just like Redbox. But Redbox was already over here, kind of that next reinvention and Blockbuster was trying to catch up. They were trying to bridge the gap between their stores and in here. So if I'm Blockbuster in the 1990s, what am I trying to do to earn more customers? Well, I'm trying to improve my selection maybe get better pricing, uh, two for one deal, whatever it is. I started to sell concessions. Maybe I changed my lobby hours. Maybe I trained my teenage uh, cash attendants to, to be better customer service agents, okay? The problem is this right here is quickly gonna go out of business, okay? So Redbox is gonna eat your lunch. If, you, if this is your business model, I can walk up to a Redbox as I'm going to get my McDonald's um, within three minutes, have everything I want and I don't have to walk into a store, okay? And by the way, it was much cheaper at the time. Um, these were brand new movies coming out at the, when it, Redbox first came out for a dollar a piece. So they're a lot higher than that. Okay, so here's my point. If you don't reinvent yourself, somebody else will reinvent your business model and you can be along for the ride or you can choose not to. Blockbuster chose to go out of business by basically not reinventing what they're doing. Okay. We need to be doing this um, exact same concept on the personal level. So think about your skill sets as you go through life, okay? Zero to one, and this is all general. So if, if I've got parents out there, uh, we can challenge this, but um, you learn to walk, talk, crawl, and smile. Then you learn to do some basic math, arithmetic, start to learn how to socialize, maybe learn how to read, maybe learn how to swim, okay? 10 to 15, character, work, reason. Um, that's basically your you know, middle school, high school years. Um, and then you start going to high school and college and you get some technical skill set. That's where you're going to college. You wanna be an engineer, business professional, whatever it is. Um, maybe you become a parent. There's a lot of learning that goes along with that. Uh, I call this adulting, whatever you want to call that, paying bills, uh, paying a mortgage, all those things that go into kind of being a full-time independent adult. Uh, you learn how to cook and towards the beginning here, maybe more how to drive. So here's my question. Most people, there, there, there's a natural progression for a lot of these, uh, walking and talking and socializing. Uh, there's a purpose for some of these other ones, technical skills, adulting, uh, driving, okay? Most people uh, that you and I know, they kind of stop with their, with their learning and it kind of stagnates. So that means that we are essentially ostensibly doing exactly what Blockbuster is doing. We are not reinventing ourselves, okay? So there are, there are other things that you learn as you go through life. Um, if, you get a, if you get a doctorate, you're going to be out to here 35, 36 still in this technical ability, and then you can start your career. Uh, so advanced technical understanding. So whatever industry you're in, if you're in marketing, you get really good at social media delivery, point of purchase, all, all the things that are technical about your job, you're going to continue to, to learn how to do that. You're going to get really good at it. Okay. Advanced parenting. Um, that's learning how to raise a teenager. Um, you learn how to take care of a home. Everything I, I know about how to uh, work in my home, I can go onto YouTube. Hey, I got a closet sink. What do I do? Um, same thing for auto care. So you, you kind of learn these as well out of necessity. So when, when I talk to my students, I tell them the single most thing that differentiates you from somebody else is your ability to, to learn and your ability to want to improve. Okay, so lifelong learners, uh, by the time they hit 35, they're done with their professional uh, schooling. Um, they're they're kind of done with the early years of probably child rearing. Uh, and they're like, you know what? I'm still not satisfied. I'm, I'm not, I'm not really... Um, satisfied with, with my level of learning. So maybe they take on a foreign language. Maybe they take on a technical hobby. Uh, maybe they want to learn how to do computer programming or you know, make, make a side business. Maybe they're really into the dynamics of local, state, federal politics, right? That, that's kind of a skill set to kind of interpret all that. Uh, maybe they like to travel. Um, I say that's a skill set. Um, if you were to ask me the three most impactful ways of learning, I would put travel number one. I'd put reading number two and I'd put formal education as number three. Okay, some people, lifelong learners will choose this last option. And th this is by no means comprehensive. This is the list that I've kind of uh, seen predominantly in, in my peers. Okay, Th those that are engaged in reading in meaningful ways, you will reinvent yourselves. And, and that's what we're gonna talk about here 
in the last half of this talk. Okay, so I want I want to walk you through an example of that because if you don't stimulate your brain, um, it will digress. When I when I first uh, went to Antarctica, I was I was a janitor in Antarctica, and for for five months I did nothing but clean toilets, clean gymnasium, clean the dorms, whatever, and my brain was I had zero intellectual stimulation, right. Um, I remember sitting down to do a crossword puzzle. One of my friends uh, had a crossword puzzle and he said, hey, can you help me with this? I was like, yeah, sure. And I, I, looked at the, I looked at the question and my brain like stutter stepped for like a nanosecond. And, I, and I, it, was, it, was, it was so real that I recognized uh, that, that lapse in my ability to make the connection. So I finally answered it and I was like, there's something different about my brain. So there was some level of atrophy that, that happened in my brain because I was not uh, constantly stimulating myself. And this was in between uh, my first year of my MBA and my second year of my MBA. And I kind of I checked out anyway. But if you don't stimulate your brain, you will uh, experience atrophy in, in the way that your brain operates and you'll become stagnant in the same way that, you know, if Blockbuster doesn't change their business model, they become stagnant. Okay, so how does reading lead to a reinvention of who we are as uh, individuals? Um, the first case I'm gonna make is that it, um, impacts your ability to be creative. Uh, the second way it impacts your ability to um, to be practical, and I'll walk you through both of those. So this is the heart of why you should be reading literature, specifically classical literature, to um, to improve who you are as a business professional. Okay, so this this first exercise, um, I, I learned this one at a conference. Um, this the guy walks in the room, he says, "What's half a 13? Okay, so everyone in the everyone in the room raised their hand. They say, "Oh, it's six point five, right?" So he said, is it really just 6.5? And so he started challenging us and I kind of came up with these alternative answers to what is half of 13. So I say, it depends on who you ask. Uh, my, my fourth grader is working on uh, division right now. If you asked her three, 13 divided by two, uh, she would have a remainder, it'd be six remainder one, right? So she wouldn't say 6.5, we haven't gotten to decimals or uh, um, fractions or anything like that. So they just say six remainder one, six R one, okay? What would a college professor say? A failing grade. What would an optimist say? Glass half full and, and pessimist would say a glass half empty, okay? What would Napoleon from Animal Farm say? Well, some halves are more equal than others. So I didn't say equal halves, I just said what's half? Now the mathematicians in the room were saying, well, half is a half. Uh, well, not according to Napoleon. Okay, Don Quixote would say tray and say, so he, uh, he might split the word into, you know, first say it in Spanish, and second we'll put the first half of the word and second half of the word, okay? What would a Roman soldier say? He would say, I, I don't know if Roman soldiers had fractions. Someone to build everything they did, they needed some sort of fractions. Uh, VI at I over II, okay? What will, a, this, is, this is maybe my favorite one. What would a logician say? Um, it's circular reasoning. What is half of 13 equals what is half of 13? Okay, politicians say, and you've seen this all the time, that's a great question, but I think a better question is what are we doing about foreign policy? If you watch any debate, this is their answer to any question that's like straightforward. Do you agree? Do you not agree? They're like, that's a great question, but I think we need to address this first. This is your classic red herring argument. What would an etymologist say? Uh, 13 etymology is a study of word origin. So they wanna know where the word thir comes from and the, um, the suffix teen comes from, right? What would a moral relative say? Well, anything you want it to be, because there is no truth. There is no absolute truth, unless you're Schrader's cat. Contemporary artists would maybe break down the 13 into the top half and the bottom half, right? So that's half of 13. I cut that part off, right? Uh, algebra student, I, these are as many as I can come up with. These all equal 6.5, just so you know. So this represents 6.5. This represents 6.5, right? Uh, finally, uh, this, this reference might be a little bit dated. Um, what would Bill Clinton say? What is half of 13? Depends on what your definition of is is. Okay, why do I bring this up? Because if we are going to reinvent ourselves, we need to have a better understanding of what our competitors are doing because most of them are gonna be giving the 6.5 type answers. So this particular, I do this exercise in class and then we go through this next uh, um, part of the exercise where we're really trying to figure out uh, how to use this creativity. So what I have them do is say, okay, and I tell them, if you're a Blockbuster, what's the 6.5 type answer for Blockbuster? Well, I already showed you. Better customer service, longer hours, better selection, lower price, all of that, right? What are these other answers? All these like crazy, stupid answers that don't make sense? 
those are what that's that's the red box of the world that's the netflix of the world um that's the facebook of the world right um and so i say okay if you want to be creative there's a very simple exercise um, so first of all you have to forget what you know you cannot anchor yourself to previous if i'm blockbuster and i anchor myself to my previous understanding i'm just going to try and run a better brick and mortar operation okay can't condemn bad ideas bad ideas lead to good ideas right or it's like you know what that might not work uh, but maybe this other one would um, steal ideas from anywhere. This is where literature comes into play, right? And forget about cost. Just think about think about the world as as it should be, not as it is. Okay. So what I tell them, I say, okay, imagine you are a coffee shop, and you need to reinvent what you're doing for a coffee shop. What I want you to do is I want you to go to the cruise industry, and I want you to say, okay, what does the cruise industry do really, really well, or what do they do that's not not so good? Okay. And I want you to take that idea and I want you to apply it to your coffee shop. So in this case. Uh, oftentimes they say, well, you can kind of pre-order your, your destination excursions. Okay. One of the problems at coffee shops is you have to wait in line. What if I pre-ordered online? And I think they're doing some of this and I show up and it's already pre-ordered. Here's your, there's a, there's a line for pre-orders and there's a line for not pre-orders. Okay. Uh, agriculture. What do they, what do they do? Uh, what, what does a bistro do? This is the, this is the, uh, co coffee shop where, um, JK Rowling wrote Harry Potter. Okay. It's a bistro, it feels like home. What can we steal from that? Well, maybe we need to have a coffee shop that uh, it feels like you can write a novel in it, okay? Uh, here, here's a good example of a bad idea that can be used into a good idea. Okay, let's say you run a casino. What do casinos do really, really well? They know who's in their casino. They, ha they have to know if they have card counters in their casino. Uh, I'm pretty sure they need to know if they have felons in their casino. Um, and so what they'll do is they have facial recognition software. So you walk in the casino and you've, you've created a problem for them in the past, they're automatically gonna know that you're in their casino. Okay, take that same technology, apply it to a coffee shop. Okay, I recognize who's in my coffee shop and I say, uh, welcome, uh, Matt Volrath. Uh, I see that you had a, and you've got an earpiece. I see you had a white latte last time. Would you like another one of those? So most people would say, that's kind of creepy. I don't like you knowing who I am, right? Because some technology told you, right? So that's maybe on its face a bad idea, but what if we hired somebody to work in our coffee shop their only job was to remember people's names and faces and what their orders are. So you walk in, hey, that's Matt. He white latte for this guy right here, right? So that is more personable. So we've taken a bad idea and we've kind of chopped it into a good. So all these different uh, um, industries were stealing ideas from other places. Okay. So the question is, what does this have to do with literature? I can I can replace every single one of those industries with a major work. Uh, in a major industry, uh, sorry, a major classical literature book. So let's, let's say I threw Monte Cristo up there. Well, one of the things that happens to Monte Cristo is uh, he, uh, he gets uh, locked up and the way he escapes is he acts like he's dead or he kind of uh, swaps places with a dead body. So is there some marketing element there like making your competition think that you're going out of an industry but you actually kind of pop up in another place? So you can take any classical literature and you can kind of replace it with those industries and steal those ideas. So most people don't do that exercise, but what they do do is they have in their mind, let's say you've read Monte Cristo, you've read War and Peace, you've read all these books. There's, there's something that happens in your brain that says, you know what, wait a minute. Uh, and we see this with the term Trojan horse all the time. That's from classical literature. Uh, what's a Trojan horse? That's, uh, it's a virus that uh, somebody sends to your computer. It looks fine, opens up and it's, it's, it's bad news, right? So we already use some of these concepts. We need to be more intentional about doing that. So what, what your brain does is it stores that idea, it stores that experience, it stores that story somewhere to where it's going to either manifest itself explicitly or it's going to kind of uh, permeate through your, the way you're thinking, hey, wait a minute, what, what if we did it like this? Uh, and that's coming from one of these Costco stories. So what literature does for you, uh, it gives you new context to apply current ones, okay? So now you're in 15th century France. Uh, let, let me think. I, I think that was more 18th century France, okay? Now you can do what uh, Edgar, um, uh, Edmund Dantes does. Um, you can be Don Quixote, okay? Um, you, can, you can use all these other contexts in the same way that I just walked you through that creati uh, creativity exercise, okay? You can learn from others' mistakes, okay? What, what are some of the mistakes? Um, think about Captain Ahab. He commits his entire organization to a failing cause. And what is it happens to, ends in ruin, right? So the idea of sunk cost, you can learn from others' mistakes. Provide you cultural insights. I had no idea until I read uh, The Idiot by Dostoevsky that French aristocracy spoke, I'm um, sorry, Russian aristocracy spoke French, okay? 
So fast forward to the Bolshevik Revolution, 1915. There is no more French. We, we killed all the Russian aristocrats. Uh, French is a language for aristocracy and the Bolshevik Re Revolution was a kind of a ground level grassroots uh, up, okay? So what can I steal from that? Well, if I'm gonna go to a new organization and I've got an old regime and they had a certain vocabulary, I need to drop that vocabulary because it automatically alienates the other, other party. So there are ideas um, that cultivate um, by reading them um, and then provides historical background, um, which I, for me, that, that's what I find most interesting about reading these books. Okay, uh, so some examples from literature, uh, Frankenstein. Uh, by the way, if you remember nothing else, Frankenstein is not the monster. Frankenstein is the doctor. We always say it's a Frankenstein. It's Frankenstein's monster. Actually doesn't have a name uh, in the book, okay? But the whole book is about Frankenstein killing people because he feels like he doesn't belong. He's an outcast. So what can we steal from that? Moby Dick, what can we learn about attention to detail? That entire book is, it, it's actually two books. He writes the story, kind of the epic story. And then every other chapter is like, he'll go into seven paragraphs about how the rigging is done on the ship. Well, there, there's a reason for that in that if you're on a ship, you know every notch and crook and cranny in a, in a ship. And he was making the point um, that you need to pay attention to detail. So is there something we could steal from there? Monte Cristo, it, that book is all about revenge. The Hollywood version is about love. The, the book is about revenge. He, the 1500 pages of him plotting his revenge. Uh, Crime and Punishment, the, the inspector actually tells the guy, yeah, I know you did it. I'm just gonna watch to see how, how you react. Well, what if you have a problem employee? Can you use that same strategy? Uh, things fall apart, understand what incentivized people. In that particular case, wealth was attributed to how many yam fields you had. Okay, Bleak House, that, that's a comedy about how lawsuits never end in, in victory. Um, the Hobbit could be a kind of a lesson in kind of uh, moral relativism in terms of uh, some, of the, some of the specific uh, characters that, that happened there. Uh, War and Peace, I think, um, is another example of historical context. And then Into the Heart of Darkness, I think, is a great example of how to mitigate sunk cost. So these are examples from literature um, that you can kind of borrow uh, for your own ideas. Okay, um, I want to give you some examples from my classroom. Um, I, do, I do a couple of short stories in my uh, classes, Shooting an Elephant uh, by George Orwell. Uh, we cover Bartleby the Scrivener in one of my classes, this very obstinate, obdurate individual doesn't want to do anything. And I tell the students, okay, you're HR, what do you do with this guy, right? So they're engaged. Um, Fort, Fort Hay State, where I teach, is where we're still a liberal arts, and this is kind of the, the culmination of those liberal arts, is we got everything kind of coming together. Uh, in my culminating class, which is uh, Management 650, it's a business strategy class, I kind of give them the, the same, the same uh, idea that you've got to reinvent yourself, and I give them an option of seven or eight different uh, projects they can work on, one of which is to read two of the greatest novels of all time, Okay. Uh, for that same reason. So I incorporate this into my classroom, but I want to give you some practical um, uh, insights into what this does. This is, so this is all anecdotal. Um, it's going to increase your vocabulary. You will learn uh, new ways to express yourself, okay? Second thing, linguistics. If you're learning a foreign language, you will have uh, what, the, what the Germans call more, well, we call it mnemonic devices. They would call it uh, Eselbrücke, and that just ba means basically associations with the words. So let me give you an example. Uh, jewelers have a magnifying glass that they look at diamonds and, and, and gems and everything, right? That's called the jeweler's loop, L-U-P-E, right? The word in French, German, and Spanish for magnifying glass is lupa, which means magnifying glass. So if I, if I see the word jeweler's loop in one of my, one of my books and I, I'm trying to learn French, I'm like, oh, loop, I, I know that, that's jeweler's loop. Okay, you'll become a better conversational with, conversationalist. If you are on a, a plane for four hours with somebody and they're from Russia and you have read Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, you have at least something to talk about, okay? Uh, we talked a little bit about the simulation, the cultural knowledge. Um, here, here's an example of a uh, writer. Um, so the first sentence, we tried a few things, couldn't quite get that stuff out of there. So that, this might be something you write in an email to your boss or to an operations person. We employed several extraction methods but could not quite remove any of the residue or remaining material substantial difference in those two sentences based on the vocabulary that was used, okay? So if nothing else, those practical skills um, are there. So first, first practical suggestion I have is read to learn. When you're reading it, don't just read it for entertainment. Combine reading and traveling. Uh, could you go to Russia and, and read Dr. Shivago before you go? 
or read uh, Arabian Nights before you go to Morocco. Um, love in the time of cholera, but when you go to Colombia, right? Um, listen to audiobooks. You can multitask. If you're driving, audiobooks are a good way to do it. I like to buy my books so I can write in the margins. Uh, when I was an undergrad, I used to buy books and, and write new words that I hadn't seen before. Uh, and you've got, to, you've got to give up something else uh, to do it. Um, so I suggest stop watching Netflix um, if you really want to improve your, um, your skill set. Okay, here's your bonus. I want you to find the greatest novels of all time, and I want you to read them in the course of one year, five years, or 10 years. Um, and it can be done in a year. And, I, and I'll show you an example of that. Um, here's, the, here's the list that I used, and there are several lists out there. So look, War and Peace, Infinite Jest, uh, some of these are, you know, they're going to take you a week or two, three, four weeks to read. But some of these greatest novels of all time, you can read three or four of these in a single day, right? So it, it's, it's not as daunting as it sounds, but I promise you, if you read the 100 greatest novels of all time, it will change your life. Um, it'll change the way you communicate. It will change the way you see the world. It'll change the way that you solve problems. So that's your bonus uh, um, challenge at the end. So. Um, last, I, I kind of want to end with this with this quote right here, and that is, "Fear the man of one book." So most of us are focused on what's right in front of us. If we have one book, we don't have perspective. We can widen our lens by reading more and understanding how historical and cultural practices can be applied uh, to our own lives. And I think I'm pretty close to 45 minutes. How are we doing, Matt? Sorry, Dr. Volrath. That's great. Okay. We, we still have some time for questions. This is okay, I, I want to leave time for questions. So um, that was a lot for 45 minutes. So fire away and we can, do we have anything in the chat right now? Okay. So if anybody has questions or comments, feel free to share those in the chat. Uh, while you're thinking, uh, something to get the conversation going. When, when you're reading, uh, maybe you have a business problem in mind, are there certain questions that you think a reader should be asking themselves in order to maybe learn a little bit better from, from a text? Like what, what, what's a, what are some tools that we can use as we're reading to try to get more out of it and connect it to the scenarios that we're dealing with ourselves? Yeah, so I, I think we naturally do this anyway, is that we put ourselves in the character's shoes, okay? Uh, so uh, Notes from the Underground by Dostoevsky, this, this wretch, wretched character, he's like, he's like in the dumps, he's depressed or whatever. It's like, okay, have I ever felt in a way that this guy's felt, like, or even elements of that? And what would I do to get out of it, okay? Uh, so I, I think as you read the characters, even though it's a character you don't necessarily identify with, ask yourself the question, what would I do if I were either managing this person or if I were this person myself? I, and I think we naturally gravitate towards doing that, but so we have to be intentional about it. That's great. Um, a couple of questions are coming through in the chats. One, one more I wanted to throw in before we dig into those. You talked some about uh, how reading and traveling converge. How, how do you think reading helps us get more uh, out of traveling experiences or uh, maybe interact a little in a, in a better way with people from other cultures uh, that may, it might be a business setting or another type of setting? Okay, I, I, think, I think the best thing that it will do is it, it's gonna give you some cultural insights. Uh, let me give you an example of this. Um, if you read the trial um, or let's say any, any of these uh, 20th century German novelists, which is that's 19th century, but you get this understanding that in, in the United States, we're very patriotic, right? It's like 4th of July, great, whatever. Um, but if you go to Germany, um, they don't have national pride. And that comes directly from national socialism of you know, Adolf Hitler's regime. They're not allowed to be prideful about their country. They can be prideful about winning the World Cup, they could be prideful about you know, winning a gold medal in the Olympics, but just being a German, that's not gonna get you anywhere, right? Because that led to us having problems in the past. So what, what, what I find at traveling and culture, they, they converge uh, is that you have an understanding of why the people are the way they are. So that when you go to Germany and you're kind of like USA, USA, uh, they're saying, well, you, you were just lucky to be born there. In the same way, I'm lucky to be born German. I got nothing to be proud of. Um, it also gives you kind of historical, uh, you can go to some of these towns that have been described in the novel and you and you could picture the characters walking across the plaza um, to go to confession or to uh, you know to go down this river or whatever it is 
I, I, I just find it really cool to be in a place where you can picture um, the characters and then kind of vicariously yourself in those particular situations. Uh, so we, we have several requests uh, for you to share the list of novels that you've been reading yes. through, and if that's something that you'd be willing to do. So can, can I email that to you? So this isn't, so full disclosure, this wasn't my list. There are several out there. Um, this was put together by a group of librarians, but it has a, um, it does have all the, the page. I kind of prioritized it based on the page numbers. I kind of had a game plan for the year. I needed to read roughly 12 books a week, or sorry, 12, 12 books a month. Um, and I can kind of tell you, okay, it's going to take me three weeks to read these four books, but I, I can kind of catch up the next month, but I'll, I'll share that to you or share that over. I'll email it to you and we can email that out. Okay. And thank you very much. And yeah. going along with questions about the novels, somebody's asking, what was your most life-changing novel, the most life-changing novel that you read and, and why? Oh man, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I was entertained by most of them. Um, but I think, I think the one that I really uh, was drawn to was probably uh, Crime and Punishment. Uh, because the character, he did commit a murder, um, but it was an, es I'm not justifying his actions at all by any means, but it was escalated. So it's like he starts off, he just wants to kind of short her on rent money. And then he gets mad at her and then he finally kills her. It's like, I, I can identify with kind of the escalating like commitment of like um, sin and anger and emotion. Um, but I, I, I would say I was thoroughly entertained by Moby Dick, uh, surprisingly entertained by Moby Dick. Uh, and the one I enjoyed the least was Ulysses. I just think he was too lewd for lewdness sake, but um, yeah, certainly Crime and Punishment was right up there. Okay, I see one. Do you think Amazon's still an ethical business at the economic scale it has reached? Um, and could I give my opinion on the GameStop Robinhood stock situation? Okay. Uh, Amazon, I don't think the size of the business would determine if you're ethical. I'll go back to Thomas Aquinas. If those are being used for the public good. Uh, and what I would say about Amazon is they have what they call a flywheel strategy where it's like any cost that they save and they'll, they'll weasel down every price they can. And maybe there's some ethical questions around that. And then they'll put that back into making cheaper prices for the customers. And then they get you know, bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, so is he using it for the common good? You could probably argue for both sides. He is trying to you know, fund a space mission. So you could argue that there's some there, but I don't think the size per se, it just depends on what you do with those resources. We have another question for people who have not read much literature. Where's a good place to get started? I would start with classics, um, but I would start with the shorter ones. So there are some very short books. For example, you could read Steinbeck's, uh, um, I can't think of the name of it, uh, Mice and Men. You can read Mice and Men in a day. It's only 100 pages, right? 100, depending on what, what print you get, between 100 and 150 pages, okay? Why would I read Mice and Men first? There's a large cultural reference to it so that when you're, you'll, you'll hear references to all these, all these books in, in pop, um, I'm sorry, in, in, in movies and in, um, in TV series. And then suddenly, oh, he's talking about mice and men. Okay, that's cool. Automatically, you feel like, yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a reader. Um, so I would start with uh, some of the shorter books, but they're classics. Okay, so Into the Heart of Darkness. If you watch, uh, you watch Stranger Things, what are they doing? They're reading Into the Heart of Darkness, right? If you've read that book, you've, you already kind of, there, so there's kind of this self uh, reflection, reflective moment. Yeah, I am a reader. Okay, because now I'm, I'm now connected to those, those other readers because now it's a reference in pop culture. So Catch on the Rye, uh, Mice and Men, Great Gatsby. These are all books you can read uh, in a day. So, so a, a question, uh, somebody says, I often view reading as a form of consumption. Do you have additional tips on how to read to learn? To read to learn is to, um, to read slower. I know we all kind of get through it, but I, I, have, I have to read slower to be able to, get, to digest what they're saying, okay? Um, and that, that comes in the form of having the time to do it. You've got to make the time to do it and you've got to eliminate the distractions. I used to uh, go to the library at the, library at the university and there was this one hallway that nobody ever went down. And I would just, I, I, walk, I walk and, and read at the same time. Uh, what does, so I, I'm, a, I'm a huge multitasker. What does that do? If I, if I read for an hour and I'm walking the entire time, I guess what? I just walked three miles and that means I burned 300 calories. So that's, that's, 
that much less time on the treadmill or walking outside. Uh, if I have to drive to work and I drive 30 minutes, um, I, can not, I can knock out great expectation in two weeks by just driving to work. Um, so you have to be able to do it. What, you can do it while you're multitasking, but you have to be able to con concentrate. So you can't be doing homework and listening to great expectations at the same time. But you can be doing something that's a little bit more rote, like walking or driving, and listen to it for, for, for that um, reading purpose. And then, of course, you have to try and put yourself in the character's shoes. Um, there, there's a great novel uh, by Tolstoy called uh, The Gambler. Um, and basically that book is about kind of, he wins money and then he kind of becomes rich, but then he like wastes it all away. And it's like, okay, I could, I, I've been to casinos. I've been in a situation where I kind of won a big hand. I kind of get a little bit cocky and then I lose it all. Uh, so you have to find a way to uh, identify with the characters. Great, we've had some really good questions. Uh, we've really enjoyed this, this talk. Thank you so much for making time. Uh, if there's any other questions, now is your chance before we bring tonight's program to an end. Otherwise, uh, we'll close here. Say thank you, Dr. Lloyd, for making time to talk with us. And thanks for sharing a, a new way to uh, think about literature and reading and turning that into something that can help us improve ourselves, uh, be a tool for self-reflection, be a tool for finding competitive advantage in business. Uh, hope everyone got something out of this lecture. and. The resources that we were discussing, I'll be sure to share those with anyone who registered uh, for this session tonight. So thank you all for joining us, and I hope you'll take some time to get acquainted with the other speakers that we have coming up in the Sagan series. Uh, we have a really good lineup touching on all sorts of different topics, and uh, whatever it is that you're interested in, interested in, I, I think they'll, there's something there for you. Uh, I hope you'll take the time to identify some, some speakers that uh, really connect with you and that you'd like to tune into. So I hope to see you again and thanks everyone for coming.